everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming out. We really do um, appreciate the support. Um, I really wanted to start out really with big thank yous because if it hadn't been for some folks here, we wouldn't be here today. Uh, we want to start with the Miami Police Benevolent Association. Did I say that right, Chief? <laughs> Who have been big supporters of the museum and continue to be big supporters of the museum. Um, Allegheny Franciscan Ministries. Um, let's see, Hot 105, 99 Jams, the Miami Times, uh, the United Community Voice, I'm sorry, yeah, the United Community Voices, um, the Overtown Common Good Initiative, uh, which has been very supportive of this initiative as well, um, but that's all around civic engagement, and then a special thanks, oh, Gabby, Gabby Reed, the beautiful decorations that you saw upstairs um, came from Reed and Associates, so she really donated her time and energy to make it look fantastic today, so if you love that, you loved her and really reach out to her. Um, and finally, a very special thanks from Going Over Town, which is um, a newsletter that I produce once, twice a week, um, announcing, celebrating all things Overtown. So we hope you'll sign up and, and, and learn what we're doing and how great this neighborhood has become. And the Black Police Precinct and Courthouse Museum itself. Um, so thank you so much. This is a special thanks and we really appreciate your support. Um, so, I want to start out and tell you why you're here. <laughs> you're here to see um, someone who I've known for a very, very long time. Little backstory: I met Ben in college. We attended Florida State together. We're both Seminoles. Yes, we got a couple in the room. Um, and he was the black uh, Black Student Union president, and I was the vice president. So we joke about, you know, we used to tell him what to do. All the women in the room used to tell him what to do. Um, <laughs> exactly, exactly. But the thing that you have to know, or the thing I hope I share with you, is um, the personality that you see on the national stage, this very dynamic, take no prisoners, go get them, move the dial, make things happen, did not start after school. He's been like that ever since I've known him. If Ben got behind it and he was passionate about it, definitely it was going to move. So while many of you have you've seen him, I think it first started with the young man in the boot camp. Uh, you saw what he was able to do with that and also with the Trayvon Martin um, case and situation. Uh, most of you are going, wow, that's really impressive. Those of us who've known him from Florida State are like, eh, yeah, that's Ben. <laughs> that's what he does. Um, so I, I, I'm very proud and very excited. And the minute I picked up the phone, he said immediately he would be here to help us support. So I want to introduce Ben Crump, and I'll let him tell more about what he's doing today. Welcoming Ben Crump. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Have a seat. Have a seat. Have a seat. Have a seat. So we're going to start with me asking a couple of questions, if that's okay, and if my my seat will turn back around, uh, and um, and then we want to open it up for everyone else. So we really hope you have some good questions that we want to ponder because you know Ben will get us straight. Um, <laughs> let's start with who you are and okay. what makes you wake up in the morning. Who are you, Ben Crow? Um, first of all, I want to say thank you. Uh, for having me here. I am so impressed with this facility. Yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. I, I'm not sure if there's anyone like it anywhere else. Only one of its kind in the country. Yeah. Yep, 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 yep. So uh, give yourselves a round of applause. I mean, it is uh, beautiful to document our history and tell our stories. Uh, I want to acknowledge Chief Dixon. I got a chance to visit with him for a moment. And to be the first of anything is tremendous, but it's more important to blaze a trail, to open the door for others, and that's what he has done. And I want to acknowledge that first and foremost, Chief. We all have a role, as Dr. King said, to play in the struggle. So thank you. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> uh, and I want to acknowledge my law partner in the back, Chris O'Neill, and uh, one of my Assistant Operations Managers Hinton Battle. Uh, they got me here, Stephanie. Right, right. <laughs> also Seminoles. <laughs> uh, and my good friend Frank Matthews, uh, uh, civic leader from Birmingham, Alabama, didn't think it robbery to be here. So thank you, Frank. Um, 
Who am I? I'm a simple country lawyer going in courtrooms, uh, doing what my grandmother told me to do, and that is to speak truth to power. She said, if you ever get a chance to speak truth to power, you do it, baby. You do it. And so what I try to do is go and really challenge America mm -hmm. to live up to the creed that they profess, uh, to live up to the words and the high ideals that they say are the most noble uh, in all the world. Like, for instance, Stephanie, I get in a lot of trouble uh, with <laughs> judges. And, and it's kind of interesting, uh, Chief, the powers that be in America are very fond of quoting the preamble to the Declaration of Independence, right. uh, you know, my question really has always been, do they believe it? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so when I'm picking a jury in a uh, courtroom and we're representing some uh, probably poor person of color, mm -hmm. uh, and we're literally asking the jury, do you believe in the Declaration of Independence? Mm -hmm. And so, do you really believe that all men are created equally? Mm -hmm. That they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that amongst them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? And, you know, I, I, I'm with each juror and I'm questioning them. Do you really believe black people are equal to white mm -hmm. people? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're trying to get commitments mm -hmm. out of them. And the judge, as Chris and them know, will say, okay, move on, counselor. Move on, attorney Crump. And, and I say, well, well, judge, this is important mm -hmm. because I need to know. If they don't believe that a black person is equal to a white person, then we've lost even before we begin. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's who I am. I'm a person who tries to make sure that uh, little marginalized children, little disenfranchised children, uh, as my grandmother called the least of these, have a voice. And I do believe that's why God blessed us with this education, mm -hmm. with these law degrees, and uh, this influence right. to go try to speak for the least of these because in many ways we were all them. Right. We Amen. were all them. I grew up in the projects in North Carolina, a uh, single mother, mm -hmm. uh, Helen, who uh, was my first hero mm -hmm. because I saw the sacrifices she made for us and she had uh, me and my two little brothers and she worked two jobs every day, one cleaning the hotel uh, laundry mm -hmm. and then working in the factory at Converse mm -hmm. uh, in the evening, the shoe factory in my hometown. And I always remember my mother said that uh, life ain't fair, baby. Mm -hmm. Life is hard. Mm -hmm. You make it fair by what you bring to the table. Mm -hmm. And if you don't bring anything to the table, don't expect anybody to let you sit down at the table. Mm -hmm. And so when I got that college degree from Florida State, uh, and I was the first one in my immediate family to get a college degree, the one thing I said to my mother is, I'm bringing something to the table, right. Mama. Amen. 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 That's right. So you tapped on something, that jury subject matter. Uh, the last time I saw you, you were here at the Lyric Theater, also in Historic Overtown, um, and you talked passionately about the responsibility African Americans need to take when it comes to being on juries. Absolutely. Um, we have a tendency maybe not to do that as much. We. Um, so I, I wanted you to share a little bit about that, and I, I also questioned, as I was reading your book, you talked about Juror B67, I think it is, um, that you learned some stuff um, in the Trayvon Martin case. Um, yeah. So tell me if that's what is now informing your opinion when it comes to that, that well, subject. Well, I, I don't know if that informed my opinion, but it reaffirmed okay. my opinion, okay. the importance of jury duty. I, I know uh, my law partner, Chris, and every uh, black lawyer would attest one of the most difficult things to do as a black lawyer is to go into courtroom with your black client and the only other thing black in the courtroom is the judge's <laughs> robe <laughs> and expect them to give you equal justice. And it's kind of profound because 
Stephanie, as you may remember, I talked about it and I talk about it in the book. Black people, we can save ourselves in so mm -hmm. many mm -hmm. ways. Mm -hmm. We only have to have the conviction to stand for something. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. we go in the courtroom and you watch the prospective jurors come in and you know, there'll be about 60, depending on the size of the trial. Sometimes there'll be 150. And you're looking, because the majority are going to be white citizens, but then you're looking at those black citizens and you say, okay, I see four, I see six, <laughs> I see eight. And, and you like, you literally in your mind's eye, you say, okay, where are they going to be positioned at? My Lord, please let someone be positioned in the first 20 that we call because, you know, mm -hmm. you very rarely mm -hmm. going to get to the back right. pool. So you want them in the first part of the pool. Mm -hmm. And you say, oh, man, you, I mean, you start <laughs> standing up. You say, I got three in the first seven. I got five in the first 20. I mean, at least I'm going to have one on this jury. And you, that's how you thinking because one person in that room in the deliberations changes the whole conversation. Right, 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 if you just right. got one black in the room, I mean, mm -hmm. people are not gonna watch what they say. They're gonna listen to that black person in many ways, because if it's a black citizen, they're saying, well, do they think they should be exonerated or do they think they should be compensated? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. forth, because now if the black person don't think they should get any money if it's a civil suit, or if the black person think that they should go to jail, well, that's a foregone conclusion. <laughs> no, they go into jail. Right. <laughs> uh, because they wait to see if they're going to get any resistance, Chief, from that one black juror who made it on to the jury panel. But, you know, you sit there, Stephanie, and you listen to brothers and sisters come up with every excuse imaginable to why they cannot commit to spend three to five days to sit on this jury to save the life in many instances of this young black boy mm -hmm. from becoming a convicted felon. I mean, they I mean, they say all this stuff about black lives matter mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. our children are the most important things in our community, the most important thing to the future. And then when you have an opportunity mm -hmm. to make the difference, the direct opportunity to make a difference in a young African-American life, you say, oh, I got to go watch Real Housewives of Atlanta. <laughs> you know? I mean, you but come up you with... do you think they you know come... that, though? I mean, really, do you really think you have an impact in a, in a courtroom in that way? Do we understand that? I, I, I think they understand it. Okay. But a lot of them just don't want to commit. Okay. I mean, it, and it's a commitment. It, it, it's a commitment because you're going to spend three to five days at minimum most times in trial, maybe uh, ten days mm -hmm. to deliberate and listen and so forth. But it is a commitment that you have to take if you want the uh, American Constitution to apply to all of us fairly and equally. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's... It's one of those things, Stephanie, I'm blown away. And Chris, I know you see it. The Fox News watchers, boy, they be waiting to get on that jury. <laughs> they like being waiting a whole year for the opportunity to get on that jury and make America the way it should be in their eyes. Because when you're on that jury, you have all the power. You know, the judge gets to interpret the law, but you get to render the law for all intents and purposes. And it's a situation, a lot of times, uh, us, what we call advanced trial lawyers, we, we really know how to uh, persuade a jury and influence a jury because the jurors, you know, they are given the laws and the evidence and they say you have to apply the facts mm -hmm. and the law and the evidence to get your verdict. Mm -hmm. Well, part of the jury instruction is common sense. Mm -hmm. We want you to bring your common sense into the courtroom. And so what I tell the jury oftentimes in my summations, I tell them, you know, it don't matter what I said, it don't matter what my opponent said, it doesn't even matter what the judge said. This is your vote today. 
And this vote is more important in many regards and more impactful than your vote for the president or mm -hmm. anything else because mm -hmm. it's one out of six or one out of 12. And your vote can make the difference because in Florida, you have to have a unanimous verdict. Right. And one person okay. can make sure that that black child is not part of the prison industrial complex or that one vote can say we're going to give fair compensation to the uh, the brain uh, affected children in Flint, Michigan, right, and so right, forth. Who I hope right. we can talk about is right, right. that is <laughs> that one person in that room can say that, and I always tell them that your common sense, right. use your common. Right. You know what this case is about. You knew it even before we started explaining it to you, and, and you know. It, that's why we, I'm sure we're going to talk about the value of black police and uh, right, black right, prosecutors right, right, and right, black right. judges because you want them not to leave their life experiences home. Right. We want them to apply their common sense. Uh, you know, everything cannot be uh, as black and white and technical. We know that our children are just as worthy as right. little white boys right. and girls of getting the benefit of the doubt the benefit of possibility, the benefit of consideration, but yet we rarely get it. Right. But you talked about, and with your, it's B67, correct? B37. B37. Um, as I understand it, a lot of their opinion came from just preconceived notions, stuff they thought they knew. Yeah. So if you could talk a little bit about that and, okay. you know, again, that kind of, I, I'm assuming they were white. Yeah. So h how that... You had an all-white jury in Trayvon's case. She's talking about um, the trial of George Zimmerman for the death of Trayvon Martin. And uh, you had all-white women. One was biracial. Um, don't know what she associated with, whether it was more white or black or mm -hmm. what have you. But to that end... You had B-37 who came and did an interview with uh, CNN Anderson's Cooper mm -hmm. in the aftermath, and she said that she knew George Zimmerman was a good person and his heart was in the right place because apparently nine or ten months prior to him killing Trayvon Martin, he was this neighborhood watch volunteer, and he allegedly was trying to uh, capture a person who had burglarized the home of a white woman, and it happened to be a black person. Uh, now, he never found him and so forth, but she said that he tried hard and he was dedicated and all this here. And it still breaks my heart to this mm -hmm. day, Stephanie. And I got I'm calls sorry. from all around the country during that trial. And, you know, the prosecutors, you know, in trying to defend the dignity and honor of Trayvon's life, I believe it was like a fish-out-of-water experience for them mm -hmm. because so many times all prosecutors do is put black boys in prison every day mm -hmm. and twice on Friday. Mm -hmm. And so, you know... Watching that whole thing, there were so many things I would have done differently. Everybody would have did differently mm -hmm. if we got to be the lawyers in the criminal case on Trayvon. But, you know, as, learned. as high school After civics, the only people who can uh, put people in jail and take away their liberty is the elected uh, district attorney and their lawyers. Mm -hmm. And so that's why voting is important, too, because that DA really determines mm -hmm. who goes to jail mm -hmm. and who doesn't go to jail and the whole grand jury process. But in this situation with B-37, we are just heartbroken that the judge said that a crime that happened 10 months ago was going to be allowed to be a feature in the death of mm -hmm. an unarmed 17-year-old mm -hmm. kid walking home, minding his business on the telephone Skittles. with a bag of Skittles and a mm -hmm. can of iced tea because th she allowed this white lady who knew nothing, nothing about what happened on February 26, 2012 when 
Joy Zimmerman profiled and pursued Trayvon and shot him in the heart. She knew nothing about that. But she was allowed to testify to this predominantly all-white female jury that my house was burglarized and, and I had my baby in the apartment with me and it was by a black man. And that's when she was allowed to testify. So it was almost, Stephanie, as if, because one black person did something bad or committed a crime that now it gave this neighborhood watch volunteer the license to stop and detain and question any black person who was in that gated community. And it's just outrageous to think that because you think of all the these mass murderers by young white men that happen in America every day. Ain't nobody saying, well, now we can go stop every white man we mm -hmm. see because a mm -hmm. young white man did something bad. And that begs the question too, Stephanie. I think about, and we're talking to black police, and I think black police normally get it a lot better than their brethren uh, who are sworn to protect and serve us. But if a black kid moves a certain way, mm -hmm. they shoot and kill us. I mean, and it's just, in chapter two of the book, we say that it is titled, The Police Don't Shoot White Men in the Back. It is yeah. so rare. Mm. Right. That's true. If any, That's they true. don't shoot white men in the back. And when I'm speaking at, you know, these universities like Harvard and North Carolina and Indiana to a predominantly white audience, I always say, I say, can you tell me a person of color who's been shot in the back, uh, brutalized, mm -hmm. and died as a result of police brutality, and even they will know the names. They'll start running off the names. They'll say, you know, Laquan McDonald in Chicago, mm -hmm. Walter Scott in South Carolina, Alton Sterling in uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Philando Castile in Minneapolis, Minnesota, Botham Jones in Dallas, Texas, uh, Terrence Crutcher in... Uh, uh, Oklahoma, uh, Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. I mean, 12-year-old Tamir Rice in Cleveland, Ohio. And they just run down the list. I mean, and then I say, now tell me a white person who's been killed by the police, shot in the back of brutal life. No. And it's just Cricket. crickets. It's <laughs> silent. And, and to make the point, because I'm a trial lawyer, I tell them, I'll wait. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and you just because it rarely happens, mm -hmm. but yet a black person, I mean, it's mm -hmm. you for, and when you really want to frame the issue and put it in its full context, just imagine the young white men in America that were confirmed mass murderers, right. like mm -hmm. in Parkland, Florida. Mm -hmm. He shot mm -hmm. 34 people, mm -hmm. killing 17 of them. The police followed him for hours, and they took him alive. Mm -hmm. They did. You yeah. Right. And then yeah. you think about the Waffle House mm -hmm. shooting up in Tennessee, shot six people, killed four of them. The police followed him into the woods, chief, and they all came out alive. Now, can you imagine if a black man <laughs> no, he wouldn't was accused of killing a person the and they all go into the woods? <laughs> Y'all think that black man that. coming out of line? No, 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 no. And then, and then the worst of them all, Chris, the worst of them all, the young white supremacist, Dylan Roof, who oh. went into that church yes. in South Carolina yes. and killed nine black of people. the most innocent people you could ever find. And you all remember when the police interviewed him, what he said, Frank. He said that I felt bad about killing them because they were so nice to me. Yeah. Mm. And the police not only followed him for hours, they followed him across state lines from, North Carolina, from South Carolina into North Carolina. And then when they apprehended him, they took him to Burger King to get a burger and fries uh -huh. on the way to jail. <laughs> and that underscores in America, white men are arrested and protected 
yeah. why black. black men are shot and killed. And that's just reality. And there's a reason for that. And, and you know, when you read the book, you'll understand this whole mentality of what the law tells us, who you are allowed to kill in America and who you are not right. allowed to kill in America. But you tapped on something that wasn't even part of my question list. You talked about the police. Um, of course, we are in what was a historic police precinct, and I've had a, the good opportunity to talk to some retired officers who's talked a lot about the training. Um, how are we training some of our officers today to be more sensitive, all, all officers of all color, to be aware of their surroundings? A lot of times you find black officers that are a little more familiar with the area, maybe they're a little more familiar with the people, they have a little bit more sensitivity, <coughs> um, other than officers that may have heard something about a neighborhood and just shoot to kill. What are some of the things you would recommend in terms of training that we need to be looking for and, and making sure that our officers, our black officers or officers of color are intricately involved in that, in that Certainly. process? I, I can give a perspective as a civil rights lawyer and that is my perspective now. I come in through those lens. I know uh, Chris was a police officer 10 years before he mm. became a lawyer. So I often lean on him to talk about these things but it becomes fundamental to me that you hopefully will have police officers who are connected to the community. Mm -hmm. Because unfortunately, mm -hmm. yes. Chief Dixon, what we see a lot across America is you have police officers who don't even live in our communities, mm -hmm. live in a community uh, that looks nothing like our community. Mm -hmm. And they come in and police our community with and then notions. with preconceived notions, mm -hmm. and they protect and serve everybody else, but they police us. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. and, and I know Dr. Randy Nelson, uh, who's a, a, a clinical expert, uh, psychological analysis, does a lot of work with uh, police around the state, and mm -hmm. does a lot of work with Bethune Cookman. Uh, we had this thing called uh, minority contacts. Mm -hmm. uh, police minority contacts because what you don't want if you can help it the first time that our children have an interaction with a police officer that's a it is a life or death mm -hmm. encounter Absolutely. And, and unfortunately oftentimes a lot of our young people the first time they have an interaction with a police is it's he got his gun exactly. drawn, mm -hmm. and he's making a split-second decision on the value and the character of this person because we don't really have the community police, and we don't have the mm -hmm. officers getting out of the cars, walking down the streets of the community that they're supposed to be protecting and serving, and getting to know your children or getting to know your brother, getting to know your husband. So when they see the person, they say, oh, no, he's not a threat. That's Hattie Mae's husband. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's uh, Miss Wilhelmina's uh, grandson. You know, I grew up with him. You know, I know these people, <laughs> and, and you he want that, that, but we, we don't have that because for whatever reason, we would prefer to have people say, no, no, you just come here for eight hours and then you leave and you never have to have any dealing. You don't have to know the uh, church leaders. You don't have to know the teachers. You don't have to know mm -hmm. anybody. You just come and you police this uh, community of color and you enforce the law. Mm -hmm. And that's what you find happening. So I, I don't know if I'm Adding gonna, more community yeah, policing components in you there. Just, just trying to change the perspective that this isn't a war zone. You remember the thing about Ferguson and Michael Brown? Mm -hmm. They always considered that little black town to be a war right, zone. Right. You remember I what agree. Officer I Darren agree. Miller said who killed Michael Brown? He prepared for battle every day he went to work. Okay. That's a terrible mentality. Right. I, I am agree. coming to go to war with somebody. Right. And That's so it. you don't want the police coming to say we're going to war with the black community or the mm -hmm. brown community. Mm -hmm. We want them saying, I'm coming to protect and serve. Uh, I'm coming to be a peacemaker, mm -hmm. you know? Not even a peacekeeper, mm -hmm. a peacemaker. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to die, uh, have conflict resolution. Mm -hmm. I want to de-escalate situations, not escalate them. But oftentimes we see uh, amenities, white police officers, when they interact with our children, they escalate it. 
I mean, it's almost as if they're challenged. If the, the young person who oftentimes aren't equipped to make the best decisions, but you're the professional. Mm -hmm. You're the adult. Mm -hmm. Aren't you the person who's supposed to be mm -hmm. trying calming to say, down. calming everything down? Mm -hmm. But no, they ratcheted it up mm -hmm. to the point where it's a life or death situation. And unfortunately, the United States Supreme Court has told police in America, this is the get out of jail pass for when you kill a person in America, especially a person of color. Mm -hmm. All you got to do is say three words. All right. I felt Staying fear. Oh, right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And you all If you, you said I felt fear, I was threatened. Mm -hmm. Open season. It is open season. <laughs> I mean, and that's what you see happening. And thank God for the advent of video and technology because for decades, black people were saying the police brutalized mm -hmm. me. And the police, no. did, you know, shot me when they right. didn't have to shoot me. But now we got video, so people are seeing that black people haven't been lying all these years, that we've been telling the truth. And I think we got so much work to do. The thing that I'm so afraid of, specifically on policing in America, is this whole notion where they keep discovering all these KKK members who right. are within right. the police departments. That is horrific because when you think about it, you ask yourself, well, every arrest they made, how do we properly evaluate that now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, every arrest of a, a person of color or minority. And so we have a lot of work to do in America. Are there methods now where we are looking at that kind of thing? We know it needs to be, ne we know it's necessary, but it, has that become a part of the discussion of evaluating if there's sort of this fair process going in? Well, I, I'm not certain under this administration they it find it important right. to do that, but who's ha who have been doing this and making these discoveries have been the media. Thank God right. for a, a right. free media. And it's not complicated, and they somewhat are emboldened. You know how they're discovering everybody right. is right. on social media. Right. right. I mean, they're being able to verify these accounts. And then you look at some of the things these officers are saying about black people, about Hispanic people, about members of the LGBT. Uh, TQ community. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of issues. Yeah, there's a lot of issues. But <laughs> the things they say are just unbelievable. And you like, this is the person we gave a legal right to right. use deadly force? Right. I right. mean, and so it's, it's posing all kind of questions. I, 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 I want to digress for a second just to mm. say yeah. something about the book. Uh, and, and thank everybody. We have been doing very well. Uh, Amazon, we've been number one for uh, a while in nonfiction legal. So um, it's an important conversation yes, it is. that we have to have with America. Um, you know, one of the main reasons I wrote this book mm -hmm. uh, when Harper Collins was in the aftermath of Trayvon, they was asking me to write a book and I feel Trayvon was the number one news story in the world. So everything that had needed had to be said about Trayvon had been said, I, I felt, and I knew his mother and father, uh, Sabrina and Tracy were writing uh, a really mm -hmm. uh, meaningful book, uh, Trayvon Martin, Rest in Power. And so I was saying, no, nah, I'm okay. I don't want to write a book just for the sake of writing a book. Uh, but they persisted and so forth, and I said, well, if some hits me, I, I'll do it because, I, I, again, I'm busy. I ain't got time just to squat the... And, Read the uh, book, you'll see how busy. Yeah. <laughs> and so then they said, Stephanie, they said, well, will you do an autobiography? And I said, man, I'm too young to do an autobiography. <laughs> I'm I not got, ready. I got a lot of living left. <laughs> and so, um, but then... It, the aftermath of uh, the killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, uh, where the young people refused to remain silent. All right. I mean, those young Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. activists, those college students, those black college students, white college students, Hispanic college students in St. Louis refused to let them just sweep Michael Brown's death under the rug, uh, even when 
the DA in St. Louis County was prepared to just wash everything clean on this officer who 14 people, 12 black and two white people said that when he shot this unarmed 18 year old kid in broad daylight that he had his hands up. Mm -hmm. And then the clarion call, hands up, don't shoot, mm -hmm. went viral all over the world. And Chief, those young people, Mark, they just refused to remain silent. And the governor of Missouri called in the National Guard. And Frank, you all remember saying uh, the news coverage in Ferguson, I mean, they came in there like a conquering army. Mm -hmm. They had all this military uh, equipment, they had riot gear, they had masks on, they had drones, they had assault rifles. I mean, it's like they were going to war mm -hmm. with this small black town in Missouri. And those young people still refused to remain silent. And I remember this one particular young brother, he couldn't have been more than 19 or 20 years old, maybe or younger than that. When the National Guard was out there and all the cameras, CNN and Good Morning America, everybody was covering it, he walked right up to mm -hmm. the National Guard who had their assault rifles trained on him at Center Mass. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was fearless, Stephanie. Mm -hmm. He came right up to the tip of the rifle mm -hmm. with his face almost touching the gun. Mm -hmm. And he was screaming at them. He said, go ahead and kill me now with all these people and all these cameras out here mm -hmm. because y'all going to kill us anyway when they go away. Mm -hmm. So kill us now so people can see how y'all are killing us. And I was just riveted by that. <laughs> I was afraid for the young man's right. life, but I was riveted because I said, he's right. It is important for the world to see how they're killing us, but not just were bullets from police guns, mm -hmm. but more poignantly, yes. how they are killing us every day, in every city, in, in every state, room. in every courtroom in America with these trumped up felony convictions. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, mm -hmm. it's like they're killing us softly. Right. But right. is genocide still the same? You do understand in our state and states like Tennessee, one out of every five black men are convicted felons. And the experts opine if this trend continues in the next 25 years, one out of every three black men in America will be, will be a convicted mm -hmm. felon. And so I want y'all to indulge me for just a second, if you would. Consider that you are a black parent and consider that you have a black male mm -hmm. son. Mm -hmm. And consider thing. that you have a black male nephew. Mm -hmm. And consider you have a black male cousin or grandson. Mm -hmm. One of them. And okay. consider they are four years old, five years old, six years old, and they're playing as children often do. And just observe them for a minute or two and see if you can figure out which one of them in the next 10 to 15 years will be identified and labeled as a convicted felon and live the rest of their lives as a permanent underclass citizen in America, a person with your blood running through their veins. And I know we have a lot of black bourgeois <laughs> Negroes who say, uh oh, that, that's not going to happen in my family. That only happens to these people in the hood. That only happens to these people over in the ghetto section of town. It doesn't matter what job you have, what your income is. It doesn't matter at all. If Trayvon Martin stood for anything, it stood for the proposition that it doesn't matter if our children are in gated communities, mm -hmm. suburbs. Uh, it don't matter.
because they are targeting our children in this school to prison pipeline. And you got to know that you are not immune mm -hmm. to the statistics. Mm -hmm. This can happen to your baby or your nephew or your little cousin. And if we don't stand up and fight for our children, then it's going to get worse and worse and worse. And so we have an obligation here to say that our children's lives matter and mm -hmm. mean it. And part of that is serving on jury duty. Mm -hmm. Part of that is trying to encourage our people to vote in these okay, elections right. because the mayor is going to decide mm -hmm. who the police chief, the right. state attorney is going to decide who goes to jail, right. the judges right. are going to decide who gets uh, given a little slack. And it's all a matter, in many instances, a couple of hundred votes or a couple of thousand votes. Right. And if we come out to vote, we can tip the scale. But now you talk about the judges' race. Now I, I, I own, I voted in, in some of them. But mm -hmm. I can't say I really knew what I was voting for. Right. Other, but for a couple of organizations in the community that did a debate or two here or there, um, it was really me Googling to see what, what cases I saw that they may have been involved in or their background. People of color, how do we look at who we want to vote for in terms of state attorney, judges, local, yeah. that, especially if you think you would never go before a court. Yeah. I, I hopefully I never will, but well, it's still I, I will say this now. This whole notion of us going before court, uh, we oh, do a, a, a big thing with Colin Kaepernick and so okay. forth called Know Your Rights. And we talk about these statistics. If you're black in America, there's a good chance you're going to be stopped by the police before the age 40. There's a good chance mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you're going to be stopped. I, they're going to that stop you. And that's a statistic. And, you know, we are stopped almost uh, 2.8 times more than white people, exact same everything. Mm -hmm. You know, it's going to happen. So there's a good chance you're going to have some interaction with the criminal justice system okay. if you're black in America now. Uh, most of the time, hopefully it could just be a traffic citation, mm -hmm. but with young people it gets worse. You asked about judges. I only thing I can say is this. The black churches play such a vital role in our community. Mm -hmm. Maybe the barometer that you can use if there are black lawyers who are judges who attend your congregation, you need to inquire about them. Mm -hmm. Do you okay. know this person? Is this a good person? Or if you got good black newspapers or uh, mm -hmm. good newspapers, look at what they're saying about their uh, percentages and their demographics on how they sentence people. Okay. Uh, you know, you, you want to just try to know because at some point your child very likely will come before that judge. Okay. And it, you know what's so deep to me, Al? I said it quickly. We, I spent half my time in Tallahassee. Mm -hmm. I, I still live there, but I travel a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's so deep to me. Florida a and University is located in Tallahassee. Mm -hmm. It is a stark difference of how the judges and the prosecutors treat FAMU students mm -hmm. versus Florida State students. Even Florida State students of color? No, not a, a general, white, right, white okay. student. Okay. It is a stark difference. I mean, it's almost, you would think if it's a close call on whether they're guilty or innocent and they're in college and they're trying to become a, mm -hmm. a productive, constructive citizen to society, that the judge would say, okay, we want to uh, try to, you know, give them the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. No way. I mean, you have them sentencing little uh, boys at FAMU and girls, but especially boys, giving them the max, doing the most they can do. And we've seen it. We ain't talking about something theoretical. Mm -hmm. I mean, Chris can attest to you over and over again. When these judges get a, a little black kid who they think is going to be somebody, they seem to me try to put them in their place early. Mm -hmm. And that's the battle. Those kind of judges... We want to vote out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, because I know a lot of your children are going to go to college and they're going to be doing the right thing. And God forbid if you get some conservative judge up there say, 
Let's bring him down a peg. This mm -hmm. little black uh, child seems to think too well of himself. Mm -hmm. And right. once I can give him that convicted felon label, it changes, it changes your life. Him. Yeah, it does. I'll ask one last question, okay. then I'm, then I'm going to open it up to the floor because okay. I know um, people really want to ask some questions, I'm okay. sure. Um, Florida just um, turned over their um, restor restoration rights uh, for ex-offenders, um, which was exciting. It was very, very exciting. Uh, a lot of hard work. Del several organizations got together to, to move that mm -hmm. dial forward. Um, I understand it's not in full effect yet because they've come up with some ways to um, still have ex-offenders pay fines. Yeah, I call it the intellectual justification of discrimination. <laughs> right. And they do it every day. They, every will, day. they will justify how to make discrimination seem logical right. or plausible right. or reasonable. For, for us not to really restore yeah. their rights. So you, I'm assuming that means we're, because we're scared. Yeah. We're scared that that's going to change the way we vote. Oh, absolutely. That's going to change. So oh, that, That's going to change the results of these elections. Of these elections. If everybody can vote, you know, if everybody can really uh, interact with the democratic process. You know right. this thing that America was founded on? Right. This principle, everybody <laughs> can vote. Right, right, right. Yeah. That thing, unless, of yeah. course, you, you've lost yeah. your rights. Um, so talk a little bit about what you think that impact will be, and in particularly in, in, in the courts and on local races. Um, yeah. Will you see that kind of engagement that will, that will turn that dial and change that conversation? Uh, I, I don't know. On the local races, how it would do, honestly, because many people don't know about the judges. They have to educate themselves. But we know on the national level, on the state level, it would make a tremendous difference. Mm -hmm. If uh, those 1.4 million people got to vote in the mm -hmm. last presidential election, it's very likely we will have Hillary Rodham Clinton mm -hmm. as the occupant of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue versus Donald J. Trump. Uh, we know that the governor's mansion in Tallahassee probably would be occupied by Andrew Gillum mm -hmm. versus uh, DeSantis because those 1.4 million people, as they look at the numbers, mostly identify as Democrats or they believe would be Democrats, mm -hmm. number one. Number two, they know that the majority of those 1.4 million people are minorities mm -hmm. so because go. America, you know, was founded as a slave-owning uh, nation. And even though we fought the Civil War and we won the Civil War, I still believe they have not completely divorced themselves of this notion of trying to have free slash slave labor mm -hmm. and so forth. So they keep trying to put people in jail because slavery by any other name is just the same. I, I know Ava DuVernay and I mm -hmm. were just uh, on social media talking yesterday, in fact, and she has a great documentary called 13. Mm -hmm. It talks about the 13th Amendment that said mm -hmm. slavery is abolished unless you are uh, incarcerated. And then, you know, the Supreme Court has never changed the law in Virginia back in 1800 saying if you're in prison, you're slave of the state mm -hmm. and that's what they consider you and so you you know it's just sad and shocking that you have this multi-billion dollar industry mm -hmm. and it that's is. what it is it an is. industry I, I i don't call it an institution it is a money is. making industry that walmart amazon uh victoria's mm -hmm. secrets everybody uses prison labor mm -hmm. A Everybody in America that. uses prison labor and they pay the prisoners sometimes six cents, seven cents mm -hmm. an hour. And it's so sad because, you know, in Florida, we lead the country in direct filing of young people. I mean, we are sentencing 13 year old, 14 year old, 15 year old, as I look at the young brothers in the back, 16 year old children as adults mm -hmm. and putting them in adult prison because we, I argue in the book, want younger, stronger slaves. Mm -hmm. and, and when you 60, 65 years old, Frank, you know, mm -hmm. you ain't really that valuable no more to the prison industry. They, they spend it more to take care of you, having to give you medicine and all this stuff. But, but those young guys that 
15 years old, mm -hmm. we can get 40, 50 good years of labor out of them. Right. For a little bit of nothing. For a little bit of nothing. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that's the mentality, unfortunately. And so the elections, uh, the governor has tremendous power. Obviously, the president has tremendous power. Who's going to be your senator and everything? Right. Those 1.4 right. will immediately have an impact on who all those people are. And, and I'll conclude with this here before we go to the question and answer from the audience. Um, ben Franklin said that democracy was like two wolves and a lamb voting on what to have for lunch. <laughs> but Chief, he said liberty, liberty is making sure that that lamb, Mark, is well armed to protest that vote. Mm -hmm. So with this book, Open Season, I endeavor to try to make sure that young lambs in communities of color are well armed to protest the school to prison pipeline. That young lambs of color are well armed to protest voter suppression. Mm -hmm. That yeah. young lambs living in communities of color are well armed to protest environmental racism yeah. that would have Little children growing up in South Central Los Angeles mm -hmm. have a third of the lung capacity as children growing up a couple of miles away in Santa Monica, mm -hmm. California, because it is legal to have toxic, pollutant, poisonous chemical factories and plants in our neighborhoods mm -hmm. where our children go to school and play and live every day. They make that legal. Uh, we have to make sure that young Lambs of color are able to protest racist Jim Crow laws like stand your ground. Mm -hmm. and, and finally, we have to make sure that young lambs in communities of color are well armed to protest the prison industrial complex, mm -hmm. which when most people go to jail or prison, Stephanie, they're only worried about losing their constitutional rights. Mm -hmm. But when minorities go to prison, especially women of color, not only do they have to worry about losing their constitutional rights, but they also have to worry about losing their reproductive rights. All right. All right. As yes. late as 2014, yes, yeah. In the state of California, you have documentation where they are coercing black women and Hispanic women into having forced sterilizations while they're in prison. So you are talking literally and figuratively about legalized genocide because everything they did was legal. And you remember what Dr. King said. He said... Just because they legal don't make it right. right exactly. Everything they that Hitler did to the Jews in Germany was right. legal. That didn't make it right. Slavery was legal. That didn't make it right. You know, segregation was legal. Mm -hmm. That didn't, didn't make, make it right. right. And so you talking about putting all these black and brown bodies uh, in warehouses in prison. And you are now you know, coercing women to be sterilized and then the age, the highest age range for people in prison and obviously black men make up the majority demographically in prison statistically. And so it's from 18 to 45. Mm -hmm, Those right. are major childbearing mm -hmm. years and Absolutely. so forth. And so, but sterilization happened in North Carolina not too oh, long ago outside uh, and, of jails, correct? And, well, I'll say this here. She said sterilization, correct, in Alabama. But, <laughs> you know, Malcolm X <laughs> would say that, uh, you know, they discriminate in the South in America. Mm -hmm. And he said, I consider the South to be anything below the Canadian border. <laughs> <laughs> and so, Everything. And, and so what, what I say about that is simply we have to fight for our children. Mm -hmm. um, it's so imperative. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. King said the coward 
asked the question, is it safe? He said expediency asked the question, is it politically correct? He said that vanity asked the question, is it popular? But then he said chief conscience asked the question, is it right? Mm -hmm. And he said there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither popular nor politically correct or not even safe. But one must take a position because their conscience tells them it is the right thing to do. It is the right thing to do to speak up for our children. It is the right thing to do to stand up for our children. It is the right thing to do to fight for our children because they're our children. And if we don't fight for them, we can't expect nobody else to fight mm -hmm. for them. Amen. Amen. So we'll open the floor for those who might want to ask a question. And we'll yeah, give, okay. And we'll give, stand? And we'll give brief stand? answers called Chris and can't tell us we they're gonna, they're giving, they're it up. And okay. If we want to <laughs> okay. sign books, we they say Okay, we yeah, that's move. important. That's important. That's yeah. important. Can you explain to us what was that madness with George Zimmerman and that last lawsuit? What was that about? Um, you know, I think it's a desperate plea for attention from him. I honestly do. I think it's frivolous. I think the courts are going to uh, conclude as such, but the thing that really breaks my heart is um, Trayvon's parents, mm -hmm. his I mother, Sabrina's father, Tracy. It is so unfair to them yeah. that this person comes up with a way every couple of years or so to re-kill Trayvon. Mm -hmm. wow. And so yeah. that that's the extent I can say on that. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, anyone else? Uh, Chief Dixon? So, thanks, Stephanie, for bringing this to this Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Some of those back there. Some of those back there. Because I know uh, with, with his schedule that uh, it had to be a special uh, privilege coming from you or uh, a request coming from you to get him here. Thank you. So, thank, thank you, Matt. One of the most intriguing things that you uh, said here, Mr. Trump, Mr. Mr. Trump was that. Uh, that, that really, I, I'm an old veteran. I've been around the block several times. But uh, you said something about uh, the two colleges. These all kids start, let's say, for the purpose of just saying, started off from the same place. Yes, sir. A good place. Mm -hmm. And uh, and your example was, and uh, I'm going to repeat this as close as I can. I'm going to paraphrase you. That. Uh, Three black kids playing in the yard. Let's say that their mother is looking at them. They're, they're, let's say they're her sons. Mm -hmm. And she knows that she has to pick one of them to be taken from society at an early age and put away and she may she see them maybe no more. Mm -hmm. Or maybe once or twice a year or a month or whatever. Right. And she'll lose that kid. And that's a heck of a decision for a mother to have to make. But that's what's happening right now uh, based on, on the statistic, statistical uh, 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 yes. statistics you show. Yes, sir. So that's something to look at. Mm -hmm. She's going to lose one of them. One is definitely going to be leaving home yeah. almost forever. Well, we got to keep fighting, but that's what the statistics that's, say. Yes. That's one a out very of three. Uh, thing for us to uh, consider. Mm -hmm. to yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just tragic, Chief. It's tragic to see. You, don't take my word for it. Uh, just go sit in the back of the courtroom mm -hmm. and watch how they administer justice. I mean, and Chris used to do a lot of criminal work, but it's just sad. Little white boys and girls have very similar fact patterns as the little black and brown boys and girls, and they just keep getting a slap on the wrist. Uh, given the benefit of the doubt and benefit of a possibility over and over, they escorted out the courtroom to live out the fulfillment of their destiny, uh, to have every opportunity at achieving the American dream. While the little black kid is taken to the corner of the courtroom, fingerprinted, handcuffed, and uh, labeled and convicted of a felon. Do we need to wrap up? I'm asking the, the team yeah, over here. Do yeah, we need to wrap yeah. up? You, yeah. One more? Okay. We'll have the gentleman over here. We got that one o'clock. 
So okay. we, we got to move. Okay. So go right ahead. I have ask one me? question, uh, Dennis Wharton. Um, what is it that we could do to help our youth survive a traffic stop? That's a great question. Uh, and, and I may ask Chris uh, to help me out on this, but what I, I tell uh, the children is the overarching theme of my book is this here. The only way we overcome the legalized genocide of colored people is we have to make sure our children are more intelligent than their oppressors. We won't win this battle with guns or violence or bullets or anything. We can only win this battle with intellect and diplomacy. We got to have smart mm -hmm. thinking children. Uh, and so what I tell them in surviving the stop is if it's at nighttime, you make sure the light is on in the car even before the police get there. They pull you over, you turn the interior light on in the car. You put both your hands up on the steering wheel in the 10 and two o'clock position. And when the police officer asks you um, for your insurance and your registration, you don't move your hand. You tell them, you have asked me for it and I am now going to reach my hand to the glove compartment to get the license and registration. I mean, and they need to move slow, don't take anything for granted. You know, people like to think, you know, and young people have attitudes, you know. Mm -hmm. They have different mentalities in there. And they, the time to challenge that police officer is not on the street. <laughs> it's about to stop, get to your mother and father, let them deal with it, with your uh, lawyer and your preachers and everybody together. But don't have them trying to do it. They got to be intelligent enough, no matter how smart they are, to know that I can't win the battle on the street. I can win the battle in the courtroom. Let me just do, even if he condescends, even if he talks down to me, even if he calls me the N-word, you cannot win that battle with him mm -hmm. on the street. Mm -hmm. And that's just what I always tell him. Uh, Attorney O'Neill may have more insight to that, how I tell because he was a former police officer and trained police officer. Sure. Uh, and I'll say this briefly, and let me step up this way so people don't have to break their necks. Mm -hmm. I'll say it very briefly. Um, the challenge that I've seen with young people, and I've done it for years in doing these traffic stops, is they don't want to turn their music down, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. They are rolling, and they don't want to turn their music down. It's an expression of them, but there's a very important point to turning your music down. The officer needs to be able to communicate with you. And so if he has music that he's competing with, the first thing he has to do is escalate his voice. So now mm -hmm. that young person perceives him as yelling at them, mm -hmm. okay? That doesn't take well to young people. So the bottom line is if you have young people, let them know turning their music down is not challenging their expression or their freedom of expression. It's their ability to be able to communicate effectively with the officer mm -hmm. because the escalation starts even at that point. Mm -hmm. So that's one that's of the first, first little tips. Yeah, yeah, most people don't that's think about it, but I'll never forget that you know, most of the time when we reviewed these, we've, I've been on citizen review boards as the officer <coughs> liaison and things of that nature. And the first thing I noticed, like, you know what? He couldn't hear them, they couldn't hear it. That's why he was yelling. Y'all mad that he came out yelling. You know why? Because he was having to yell at them. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so things of that nature that people don't think about. So they're really little subtle things, but it first starts with that officer presence, and then it's gonna be verbal instruction. You know, if we can stop it at that phrase, it doesn't have to escalate to the other, you know, uses a force. Very good. Thanks for that tip. Thanks for that tip. So I think we're going to have to wrap up a little bit. I want to say once again a big thank you to the Miami Community Police Benevolent Association, <laughs> Allegheny Franciscan Ministries, Overtown Common Good Council, United Community Voices. Uh, we forgot the historic Overtown Super Fan Zone that's sponsored by the Southeast Overtown Park West Community Redevelopment Agency. Gabby Reed of R.S. Reed and Associates is an interior um, um, an event stylist and a special thanks from Going Overtown and the Black Police Precinct and Courthouse Museum. Before we leave, we wanted to give a quick gift to Mr. Crump. Okay. If he will allow us to do so, I'll turn it over to our executive director and then we'll, we'll sign books. Yeah. Okay. So thank you once thank again, you. great man. As part of uh, being part of Overtown, is there any towners in the house? Towners. Uh, towners? Yes. For life. For life. Life. Anybody who know that, towners for life. And so um, we have one of our great businesses. One of the things that we highlight 
is collectiveness. Yes, sir. And one of our great businesses, um, ran by a young young lady who actually grew up in this community, Trina Harris. Okay. Um, she started with a sneaker business. Uh, sneaker business. She started with a sneaker business, and now she has a studio. It's called Studio One Hundred One, um, right here in Overtown. So she created these towner shirts, and I don't know why they wanted it in purple, but that's a good girl. <laughs> so we're giving. So now you are official become a towner. So you are what we call. Uh, I'm. You are official over towner. Towner for life. So when you hear towner, you say for life. You say for life. Right, Mr. Creed, I appreciate <laughs> that, man. Like, I guess we're good for life. <laughs> with the Center for Urban and Racial Equity and really excited to be here to hear Ben Crump, the people's lawyer, talk about all the important work that he does in terms of fighting for black people, fighting against police brutality. It was a great session, loved hearing his story and all the work that he does, some of the background um, around the cases that are so important from um, Ferguson to, to Trayvon Martin. So really good to be here at the museum and looking forward to coming back. How did you hear about this event? from Going Over Town, the newsletter. I got the information from an online uh, newsletter uh, with Stephanie and um, it was very interesting and I read it every day to find out what's actually going on and uh, I decided to say, let me uh, bring in my boys from uh, Daytona. I think it would be a very good experience for them to, to hear from a black perspective, from an attorney, from a person that's actually out in the field to see exactly what his thoughts are on um, how black America is being treated by white America are non-black people. And I thought it was uh, very interesting, very engaging, and I, I really did enjoy it. I, I'm taking a lot away from this, and he answered my question, and I was um, very pleased. Yeah, and uh, uh, what I'm taking back from it is basically a few uh, life experiences that I had, a few things that I've been trying to cope with as far as uh, the experiences with the law, and just uh, hearing from an aspect from an attorney and things that he had to say, it was uh, very great. I'm very glad that I came. I traveled all the way from Daytona. And um, if I had to do it again, I would. It was very great. Very great. Are you excited about reading the book? Of course. What, what, what are you most looking forward to learning from the book? Everything it is to know. Yeah. Everything it is to know. I'm happy that name? I actually came. I'm What's happy to name? be here right now. Tell Earl. me your name. Earl Taylor. Earl Taylor. I'm Carl, Carl Jones. And uh, Dennis Horton. I'm also on the board of directors for Urge Inc., who is also partnered with uh, Stephanie. Yes. My name is Jordana Hart. I'm an attorney in Miami. I also am on the board of directors and a senior facilitator for South Florida People of Color. Uh, I met Benjamin Crump at Books and Books event in November, and I wanted to come here for a couple of reasons. One was to be at an event in this space to witness it occur in this police precinct museum. And the second, because I'm interested in finding out more about his work. His book is really reflects who he is. He pulls no punches. Uh, in what he says and essentially one of my disappointments is that there were no other non-black participants aside from people who are uh, doing video and audio and other things that have to do with media and I just I'm constantly disappointed by that happening at such an important event that no white or white presenting people were here and um, I try my best to support these 
uh, events and put them out over social media and I am failing still to get other people involved. Thank you. My name is Jeremiah Johnson. I am the president of the Miami-Dade NAACP Youth Council. Uh, my name is Jared Johnson, and I, I play football at Miramar High School. And we definitely heard about this um, this thing right here because of our mom. She did hit us up and talk about, do y'all want to go? And we was like a little skeptical about it, but we definitely did want to see what it's about. And what I take from this experience is that I'll share this with my fellow NAACP members because I want them to understand that we need to be everywhere in our communities and everywhere to get understanding from people that are in our communities that are doing the great works that they believe in so that we need to put passion and belief in our own work. When I take away this, I'll go to my football team because we'll like to visit here one day because our coaches like spread of black knowledge around the world and also our youth organization at our church since we like we're part of the youth organization so we'll just decide to come here too is just spread knowledge around the community you know have black power everywhere. Alright, any other additional things you want to add? Any shout outs? Um, shout outs to definitely our church. Shout outs to everybody at my school, Miami Northern Senior High School. What's the name of that church? Um, our church is called... Here to Love yeah. Full Gospel Baptist Church. Um, shout outs to my, or, uh, my other organization I'm a part of, um, Florida Freedom Riders, my club that I'm a part of, National Ranked 2, Viking Freedom Riders. Shout and out to Miramar Pack Games for Life. Love y'all boys. Definitely to my um, one of my mentors and teachers, Miss Ebony Johnson, and my other mentor, um, Dr. Precious Simonette. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Oh, I didn't